Howdy, howdy, this is Mr. Potter. In our last set of videos, our Unit 1, we've been talking about how C++ is very similar to the languages we've already learned. We've learned Java, we've learned C Sharp, and C++ is really the progenitor of those. All of those languages that we've talked about are called C-type languages because they all derive from a common language, C. And so they have a lot of similarities, the way they deal with logic, the way they deal with variables, all of those things are very similar. So that's what we've emphasized in the first unit. But in the second unit, I want to talk about how C++ is different from the languages that we've dealt with so far. And the primary way that it's different is the way that we have direct access to memory. C Sharp and Java are called sandboxed languages because they kind of work in their own little environment and it's very difficult to go outside of that environment. It used to be impossible, but it was later developments in Java that made it where you could actually go outside of your little area of protected memory and that's when a lot of the security issues came into Java. C++ has always had that ability to directly delve into memory and that's why C++ programs can have issues with, you know, uh, running uh, lots of different exploits because of that direct access to memory. But it's that direct access to memory that makes C++ such a powerful programming language. So we're going to create a new program here. I'm going to go ahead and create a new file and we're going to call it we're going to call it parameters.cpp. So we're going to go ahead and save it as parameters.cpp. And we're going to do the usual include, include IO stream and using namespace STD. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up one prototype, which is going to be void method called A, which is going to have two parameters, X and Y. So this is a prototype. And now I'm ready for my int main. So what I want to do is I want to declare two variables. So I'm going to go ahead and say int m gets 3 and n gets 5. I'm choosing a couple of Fibonacci numbers here. And I want to see what those numbers are. So I'm going to see out m. Actually, I want to say m equals m and n equals and see out n. Just to print out the values. And then I'm going to call upon A using M as the first parameter and N as the second parameter. And then I'm going to print out the values of M and N again. And for our function, void A with int X and int Y, what we're going to do is we're just going to say X plus plus and Y plus plus. Now, when we've dealt with this in Java and we've dealt with this in C Sharp, we know that when I pass these parameters and then make changes, they're not going to make any changes in the original program. So if I was to go here and then immediately see out that x is equal to whatever x happens to be and y is equal to whatever y happens to be, then I'm going to see that x and y would be 4 and 6 respectively, but when I get to this next line after the function called a, m and n have not changed. The thing is the variables in main, they're declared in main, their scope is in main, and function a is only getting a copy of these values. And what we say is that these are uh, parameters passed by value. So in other words, they're getting a box with a 3 in it, they're getting a box with a 5 in it, and they can make whatever changes they want, but in the main method it's not going to make any change to the function itself. And if I go ahead and save this and compile this, uh, so parameters.cpp with an output uh, parameters.exe, why is it not saying that? Oh, I need to change to my workspace directory and now do that same thing. Uh, should be int m equals 3 comma n equals 5 if I'm going to compile with two variables there. And now if I run this, 
Notice that the first thing that happens is this first see out statement. We print out m is 3, n is 5, exactly as we've declared it here. And then we go into a. a is printing out the value of x and y after we've incremented them, so we're back at 4 and 6. And then we go back to our main and print out m and n again, and those values are still 3 and 5. So this is the behavior that we've come to expect from C-sharp, we've come to expect from Java, and this behavior exists in C++. What's different is what I'm about to do. So I'm going to create another prototype. I'm going to say int x, and I'm going to say int ampersand y. And I'll explain what this ampersand is in just a moment. I'm going to do a function call to b with those same parameters, and then I'm going to see out what m is equal to, and I should just probably copy this. what m is and what n is. So I'm going to recompile. Oh yeah, I need to actually do what b is. So let's go down here and let's make b. Now keep in mind the idea here was that I'm saying int x and int, and I did ampersand y. And I'm going to do the exact same thing. It's going to be x plus plus and y plus plus. And then I'm going to copy this c out statement. So these functions are exactly the same except for this one ampersand. And I want to see what happens to this. So I'm going to compile and run. And notice what happens. In our int main, our original call is 3 and 5, which is what we expected. Then we increment them by calling on a. x gets incremented, y gets x incremented, so x and y are 4 and 6 respectively. But m and n are still 3 and 5. That's our third output line. But then I call on b. What b does is b increments x and increments y, so I'm back at 4 and 6 again. But when I go back to my last c out statement, notice that n has actually changed. What's happened here is that the y parameter has been passed by reference. In other words, I haven't given it a copy of the value. I've given it a copy of the memory location. I've actually told it where it is in memory. And so any changes that it's making, it's making to the copy in memory, it's making those changes to mains, copy. And what that means is that if I was to do a third prototype, but this time I modified x and y the same way, and I was to do a call to C with M and N, and then copy this line of output, and then down here declare void C, it's going to be exactly the same as what I've got here, except the method's called C, and X is also, so right here now, both parameters have been passed by reference. In other words, both parameters should change and change permanently. They're going to change mains copy. So now I'm going to save this. I'm going to pile it again and then run it. And notice what happens. M and N started off as 3 is 5. That was the original declaration in our main. We printed out 3 and 5. We incremented x and y, so x and y went to 4 and 6, but because these were by value, my original m and n shouldn't have changed. m and n are still 3 and 5, which they are right here. But then I run b, which increments y as a reference parameter, not as a value parameter, and y becomes 6, n stays 6, but m goes back to 3 because x was not a reference parameter, it was just a value parameter. When I called on C and made them both reference parameters, they both got incremented to 4 and 7 respectively, and now they stay at 4 and 7. And this is one of the powerful things. In Java and in C Sharp, we really could only return one value. We were kind of stuck with only being able to do one thing at a time, get one result. But with reference parameters, I can actually return several values. I can change several of the variables in my main or in the calling function when I call upon a function. So that's rather fascinating. 
So what I want to do with the rest of this video is I want to actually see what do these memory locations look like. So I have declared a variable called m, and I've declared a variable called n. If I were to see out the memory location, and I want to print out ampersand m, and then print out the memory location for n, and then print out ampersand n, and I'm going to do two end lines just for sanity's sake. If I run this, compile, and print, I'm going to see the memory location. Here's the memory location for M, and here's the memory location for N. So because these are ints, ints are four bytes, you'll notice that these are actually four bytes off. This memory location ends in an 8, and if I add 4 to it, I got a 9, 10, 11, 12. But keep in mind in hexadecimal, 10 is A, 11 is B, 12 is C. So these are actually just 4 off. But if I go to each of these methods that I've written, and I do the exact same thing for X and Y, if I see out, and I want to print out the memory location for X, and I print ampersand X, and print out the memory location for Y. And I'm going to go ahead and copy this line of code and paste it into B and C. I want to show you what's actually happening in memory. So I'm going to save this, I'm going to compile it, and I'm going to run it. And the first thing you'll notice is that these memory locations here are actually different from when we ran it before. And I would come in, I would expect that. I would expect to have these located in different positions and memories for each thread or each running instance of the program. So M and M are originally these locations. But then when I call on X and Y, these were copying by value. X and Y are completely different memory locations than M and N. And notice they also happen to have a different offset. But when I pass in reference, which is what I did in my second one, notice that this memory location here and this memory location here are exactly the same. So when I'm incrementing Y, I'm incrementing N as well, because they're both pointing to the same box, and the contents of that box are being incremented. And when I pass them both by reference in function C, notice that this memory location is the same, and this memory location is the same. So I'm actually directly accessing the memory locations for those variables in main. So this is a very powerful aspect of C++ programming, the idea that we can directly access memory locations of a calling function, and not necessarily just the memory locations that we correct, create within the scope of our own function. This gives us the ability to go outside the scope as long as there exists a function call that allows direct access to those references. So probably the most important part of today's lesson is the idea of using this ampersand to access the memory location. And that's actually going to be half of what we're talking about in this unit. Uh, the other half would be how we go backwards. In other words, if I have a memory location, how do I access the data in it? But that's going to be a lecture for another time. Once again, this is Mr. Potter. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.